Let's talk a little bit about love. We took a break from Romans a few weeks ago, if you were with us, and we looked at the chapter of love, 1 Corinthians 13, and we just looked at the first few verses explaining the importance of love. As we continue our study in the book of Romans, the passage that we are going to begin today is very similar to 1 Corinthians 13. You remember last week we saw how Paul was exhorting us to live sacrificially by serving each other. And he gives us an exhortation to using spiritual gifts. The chapter that that related to most frequently, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So the passage last week is a very close relationship to 1 Corinthians 12 in the same topic. It's not surprising that immediately after the exhortation of serving in the local church, that Paul talks about the main means of relationships within the church, which is love. Now, this passage that he gives to the Romans is a little different than 1 Corinthians 13. He began with explaining the exhortation of why we should love in 1 Corinthians 13, but here he doesn't do that. He simply just says, We need to love. This certainly could be because he's already given us an exhortation to live sacrificially based upon the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. But nevertheless, the title of the message today is Genuine Love. And that's how Paul starts out this exhortation. And although it may seem like a very straightforward text, there are at least three interpretive challenges that I want to just mention to you briefly. The first of which is simply the overarching theme. Uh, Depending on what version of the Bible you have in front of you, some would count this section specifically, like for in the ESV, it says marks of a true Christian. And that's because Paul, in this specific context, does not give an introduction to what he's talking about. He just starts firing off 13 sayings, almost proverbial in nature, and each one of them loosely ties to the other, but without any conjunctions, without any particles. So it can be difficult for people to agree on what Paul is ultimately talking about. But I think it's obviously pretty clear as he says, love each other sincerely or genuinely without hypocrisy. But that is not the only issue. The sequence in which he presents this, the structure, again, without conjunctions, without particles, and without even verbs, it comes to be 13 different sayings, 13 different exhortations. So the structure, if you were organizing this, if you were preaching this message, you might be tempted to just do 13 principles that we can learn about being a good Christian. But if we take it to understand it as exhorting us to love, we can then put together some of these sayings, realizing that Paul is modifying or explaining a principle with varying statements. And if that is not confusing enough, it can even be more challenging on how we arrange these sayings. And there are two schools of thought. First, people would say you could arrange them logically. Logically, when Paul gives three proverbial sayings or three exhortations, logically you can see that they fit together. And as such, most of the verses are arranged based on logical order. But there is another way, and that's the way I chose this morning, that you can look at the original language and see that there is grammatical groupings that would give us cues to what Paul's thought was. But regardless, it doesn't change much for you. It just would mean that you could hear this same passage preached several different times and people could take different, uh, different perspectives on it. But I would say that this overarching passage, in fact, all the way through the end of this chapter, speaks on love. The paragraph that we'll be looking at today is about loving each other. Then it will be talking about later loving our enemies. And hopefully... The one another does not also include enemies. 
we, we would want to be able to understand how to love genuinely, how to love sincerely, how to love without hypocrisy. And the question would be, well, how do we do that? How do we make sure that our agape love is genuine? It's a great question. Glad you asked. That's what we're going to look at. Because as we look at Paul's combination of these proverbial sayings, fired out almost like machine gun, we will be able to see that Paul is giving us a picture of what genuine love should look like. And I hope that you'll be able to get that same thought as we look at this text together. But if you have a copy of God's Word, I encourage you to make your way to the book of Romans, chapter 12. If you've not already found your place, we'll pick up where we left off last week in uh, verse 9. And as you're able, would you stand with me, please, as a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Would you pray with me? Father, we know that love is central to who you are, for you are love. Love is central to the commands that you've given us as we understand the first and great commandment being that, to love you and to love others. We know that Jesus even further emphasized that, we know that Paul gave us a great summary that all the law is summarized in that one word, love. Father, I pray that you'd help us better understand how to love each other, genuinely, sincerely, without any hypocrisy. This we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. thank you. you. may be seated. Now, as you see this passage unfold, you can see somewhat what I was speaking of, how almost in machine gun fashion, just giving out these sayings. And rather than giving you a 13-point sermon, I do feel like there are a lot of these sayings that relate to one another. And as such, we are going to see five principles. Did I give you five or four? Four principles. Glad you were with us. And the reason why, I've changed this a couple different times. Uh, initially, I was going with the logical framework, which would follow the verses, exactly how the verses are arranged. But most of you, if you've been following the Bible or been following Christ for any length of time studying the Bible, you would realize that the verse and chapter numbers are not original in the manuscript. They were added much later. So when Paul was writing his letter to Romans, he did not put chapters and verses, but it helps us to understand it. So the verse numbers are not inerrant. Uh, they are just helping us better understand this letter. And as such, it seems as though there's one that's a little out of place, but regardless of whether you believe this should be structured logically or grammatically, doesn't change the totality of what this is focusing on. But the main idea is really going to be found in verse 9. Look at verse 9 again. It says, let Love be genuine, sincere, without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Now right away, we're confronted with a challenge. Is Paul explaining how we love genuinely by abhorring what is evil and holding fast to what is good? Or are those three separate principles? In order to be a good Christian, we must love gently, we must abhor what is evil, and we must cling to what is good. That's a great question, isn't it? I think this verse really puts a picture of the main theme of the rest of this chapter. And so I wrote this down as the main idea, and you could write it down this way. We must honestly love others in holiness. When he's saying to love genuinely, he is saying to love like God. And that is agape love, a sacrificial, selfless love, 
by which we have a concern for the well-being of another. This unconditional concern that is sacrificial in nature to the benefit of those being concerned, that is love. Why is he telling us then that we should love while hating evil and clinging to what is good? He's speaking that love is not just an emotion. Have you ever heard someone justify an action which the Bible would say is wrong by using the excuse of love? For instance, I've heard people say, well, I just don't discipline my children because I love them so much. Well, you know what the Bible says? If we withhold discipline from our child, we are hating our child, but to discipline them promptly is an act of? So you see, genuine love would mean that we would make sure that our honest love is in holiness. And let's take it beyond just parenting, but relationships. I have had countless people come into my house. I said, maybe not countless, but I've just never really tried to count. I've had several people that come to me and sit down in my office and say, Pastor, i got to tell you something. And sometimes then what follows is just very surprising. And although I've been doing this vocationally for since 2002, so 21 years, I'm running out of surprises in those instances. But still, it, it, people will come. And I have heard people say, look, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling like I should leave my spouse because I'm in love with somebody else. Or I feel like I should treat this person a certain way because it's just a loving thing to do. As if love is just this capricious emotion that comes and goes and our entire responsibility in Christ hinges on how we feel. Aren't you glad God doesn't love like that? That when he promises his love, that nothing shall separate us from his love. It's not based upon a feeling. It's based upon truth. It's based upon what is right. In the same way, we cannot use love as an excuse to do what we want. That we must love in such a way that we reflect the hatred of evil or the abhorrence of evil. And that we should, in like terms, cling to what is good. So to define love in an honest way, it would be in holiness. So that's why I think that first verse really gives us an overall arching, overarching theme for the entire remaining portion of this chapter. Now from that, Paul gives us what we'll see, four principles explaining further how we love genuinely in holiness. So it shouldn't be surprising that first principle we're going to find in verse 10 and 11. So pull that up, we'll look at this together. It says simply, love one another with brotherly affection. I'll be honest, the English doesn't do this justice because it would almost see love genuinely. How do we love genuinely, Paul? Love one another with brotherly affection. But when he says to love each other genuinely, that is the Greek word agape. That is God's love. But then as he starts this, chap or this next verse, he says philadelphos, which is brotherly love. Literally, philadelphos would be to love as of friends, directed to as brothers. But then he says, Philadelphos, Philostorge. That, that's not exciting to you. It's exciting to me. Because again, this is a compound word, phileo, which means brotherly love or love among friends, and storge. And what is storge? Love among family. So what Paul is saying is that our love of friends towards the family of God must be in such a way that we love each other like we are family. So he's simply telling us that in order to love genuinely, we need to love each other like family. And I wrote that down for the first principle. We must love each other like family. Now, depending on the family you may have, that might mean different things to you. 
What does it mean to love like family? In a family, despite our emotions, there is an overarching bond. There's a connection that we have with each other. We would say it would be a genetic connection or connection by blood. And he's saying, regardless of how you feel in your family, you're always still going to be connected. And it should remind us that regardless of what's going on in the family, that we still have a responsibility to each other. If any of you had a sibling that is close approximation in age, my brother and I are 11 months apart. Uh, people thought we were twins many times, but we weren't. And uh, that just caused a lot of tension between brothers. And uh, I didn't always really understand what it meant to love my brother until I matured a bit and we weren't spending as much time with each other. But maybe your relationship with your family is kind of like that. But one thing I can say, I may have fought with my brother a lot. I may have argued with him a bunch. But if anybody else tried to do that, I had a problem with it. And he likewise. You see, we understood that we had a connection that went beyond the conditions of our uh, specific relationship. That same thing in true in church. We are a family. Now, are we united by the same blood? Yes. It's not our blood, but we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And it is that same blood that has saved us all. We are all equal in the foot of the cross needing Jesus to save us. So in that sense, we understand loving each other like family is a recognition that we have a connection that is beyond our condition and that we should always have a love for each other. Now, as we continue in verse 10, the next saying modifies this familial love. Look back into the text again, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Love one another with brotherly affection. That's a saying. That's just one simple proverb, if you will. And the, the next proverb, outdo one another in showing honor, modifies or explains this familial love. Now, what does it mean to outdo one another in showing honor? It's a little difficult. And even in the original language, it's difficult. But in the original language, it just simply says, be first in honor. What is that mean? Does it mean when there's a parade about being honored, you should be first in the parade? No. So who is first? Everyone else. This is very similar to what Paul was writing out in Philippians chapter 2 when he simply says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Literally, put a priority on everyone else. So I wrote this down for letter A. We should prioritize other people. We should be willing to go last. The first shall be last. The greatest shall be a servant to all. That's the command that Jesus gave. It's not that we're supposed to be looking for honor from people, but we should be willing to honor others. Think of it like this. You ever been uh, walking down a hall or maybe you're at the grocery store and somebody dropped a bunch of stuff all over the floor? What is the first thing most people do? They look around to see if anybody else is going to help. And if no one else looks like they're going to help, what do they do? They might walk away or run away, but... It would have been at that point that a person would help. Now, in a situation, what it's saying is that we should be the first to show honor to others. We should depend on a relationship that is reciprocal. People may not honor you, but guess what? You honor them regardless. And it's not about 
the brotherly love or the, the Philadelphos, the loving one another in the sense that it's reciprocal. But it's the idea that we are going to always be first, the goal, to be first in honoring each other. Not waiting for someone else to start helping. Not waiting for someone else to, uh, to show this interest, but that we would do that. And that's what it means to love each other like family, that we would be prioritizing other people. Now, this is where it gave, and I went back and forth with this, but as you look at verses 10 and 11, the first saying in verse 11 grammatically ties to verse 10. And so that, I put that in there, but here it will be on the screen. Love one another with brotherly affection. Many just put a period after outdoing one another and showing honor, and then starts the next verse. And that would be the logical assumption that do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord, all are logically connected. But grammatically, it does appear that the do not be slothful in zeal is modifying the love that we have as family. So what does it mean to not be slothful? In zeal. What is slothfulness? Lazy. What is zeal? This would be an energy, the desire, the zealous person is just filled with energy. And so we should not be lazy in the energy that we have in showing love. So I wrote this down for letter B. We must not be lazy in our love. Now I will say, it's perfectly fine if you disagree. I had a draft of this outline where I did include that in the next principle. And I just couldn't, I really couldn't come to peace about it. But again, if you look at it logically, it's safe to assume that that would fit the entirety of verse 11 together. And if you feel that way, I'll say what I always say. Feel free to be wrong. But if you believe like me, I'm saying that in jest. If you believe like I do that it is going to be modifying that love, then it would be based upon the grammatical assumption. But still, nonetheless, as we move to verse 11, we have two sayings that fit for this next principle. And in verse 11, it says, Do not be slothful in zeal, which again went with the previous point, but be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. What does it mean to be fervent? The original word is like boiling, that we should be boiling up. We should, like zeal, logically it seems, would be fairly closely related, but saying be fervent in spirit. Now there is some debate whether that is spirit as in our human spirit or we should be in the Holy Spirit, and versions will either capitalize that or they'll put it in lowercase. They might even put a little A or B in front of it, and then you'll say it could be also the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, it's saying that we should be fervent in what? Serving the Lord. Be fervent in the Spirit through our service of the Lord. I wrote it down this way as a second principle, and then we'll talk about it. We need to serve each other Fervently. We love each other like family, but we serve each other fervently. Now you may be thinking, well, didn't it say serve the Lord? Was it, why am I saying serve each other? Well, there's a couple reasons. You remember when Jesus was talking to the sheep on his right hand, and he said to the sheep on his right hand that you gave me clothes when I was naked. You gave me food when I was hungry. And they said, when did we, Lord? When did we give you food? When did we give you clothes? Even as you did to the least of these, you did to me. It is our service to the Lord is in serving each other. And that certainly we see in the context of this previous chapter, or excuse me, this previous paragraph speaking about how we serve in a local church by serving each other. But nevertheless, he is talking about our relationship of love to one another. And it makes sense that he's talking about how we serve each other. And we should serve each other fervently. We should be boiling up in our uh, ability and desire to serve each other. 
How? How do we get this fervor? Well, look again in the text. Be fervent in spirit. It could be the human spirit, or it could be the Holy Spirit. But frankly, it doesn't matter. Because whether we're talking about a spiritual fervor in ourselves, or whether we're talking a spiritual fervor from the Holy Spirit, either one would still mean the same. Where do we get our internal spiritual fervor from? The Holy Spirit. So whether it's talking about our spirit being uh, uh, just in fervor for serving, a desire to be able to meet the needs of others, the willingness to use our own spiritual gifts to help others, that is still something that comes through the Spirit's gifting and the Spirit's equipping. So I wrote it down this way. Under principle number two, we are strengthened by the Spirit. Now, this is not surprising that this fits very closely to what we talked about before, which is spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are how we serve one another. How we serve in the church is related to our giftedness. But then the next saying seems to be a little bit anticlimactic, if you will. Look at, again in the text. It says, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. What is he implying by that? What was the problem, if you will, concerning spiritual giftedness, concerning spiritual empowerment that was going on in the Corinthian church? Remember, when we looked at 1 Corinthians 1 through 3, we talked about one of the problems that was going on in the Corinthian church. They were so desirous of these miraculous gifts that they wanted to show everybody that they could speak in tongues and they could do these amazing things. If you are just seeking to be empowered by the Spirit to make yourself look good, who are you serving? Who are we supposed to be serving? So what he's talking about, even though we think of being boiled over in the Spirit, that we're feeling that we are energized by the Spirit, it is not just to make us look good. Ultimately, we got to remember that when we are empowered by the Spirit, it is expressly for who to look good? God. I wrote it down this way. We should be glorifying God. We should be glorifying God. If you feel like you are spiritually empowered, and at the end of you exercising that spiritual equipping that you have been given, you feel like everybody's telling you how good you are, then you might miss the mark. What Paul is saying, we need to be filled with the fervor from the Holy Spirit. We need to be boiling up in our desire to serve one another, but in such a way that God looks good, not us. Take a look at Colossians chapter 3, I think I have in your notes, Colossians 3.23. Yeah, there it is. Whatever you do, I like that. It doesn't matter whether you're a greeter, whether you're a deacon, whether you're a pastor, whether you're serving in the kitchen. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing from the Lord you receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. See, he's talking about whatever it is that you're gifted with, however you serve in your own particular way, with however you're gifted the end result should always be making sure that God looks good. And that might mean that maybe not everyone gives you the thanks that you deserve. Not everyone is going to give you the applause. But that's okay. Because we're not in it for ourselves. We're in it to serve the Lord. And that's why those fit together. Now as we continue this next verse, there are three sayings that all fit together. And so we can all agree on this next one regardless. But take a look again at verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. So we have three sayings, three exhortations, all fitting together to explain to us the first. We should be rejoicing in hope. Obviously, in our tribulation while we pray. I wrote this down for the third principle. 
We can endure for each other faithfully. I would still say this is genuine love. How do we love each other genuinely? We endure. The idea that we're talking about being patient in tribulation, I think, is important. Uh, If you remember, in the love chapter, love is first defined as what? Love is patient. And if you grew up with the King James Version, and you remember what the word that was translated in Old English for that word patient, what was that? Long-suffering. Good. So it's almost like this. In our patience, we make our suffering long. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I like that. Well, think about it. If you're enduring, that means that you don't give up. If you're continuing to serve the Lord in such a way that you might be getting persecuted, you endure, you are patient. Instead of just giving up and making the suffering short, patience will encourage you to suffer long. And that's the idea of what we're talking about is we should be in such a way that we endure faithfully. The Bible says it in a different way, but it says, Do not grow weary in doing well, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. The idea that we should be enduring in the midst of difficulty for the sake of others. Have you ever known somebody that despite the hardship going on in their life, they just kept serving the Lord? Although they didn't necessarily see the results that you might think would encourage them to continue, they were faithful and enduring. And that can be encouraging to all of us. And that's the whole point, that we love each other genuinely in our willingness to endure hardship. Now comes that important question, well, how do we do that? Well, look back again in the text, and let's see. The first thing he says about being patient in tribulation or about enduring says rejoice in hope. Now, you've heard this in different times in the past where we're talking about in hardship. What are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Paul says in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. But even in James, it says rejoice in the tribulation. Not that we're sadistic and we love pain. But we rejoice in hope. What is hope? Hope is faith directed towards the future. It is our confidence in God in things that will be. And you say, well, how do I know what will be? Based on the promises that God has for us. I wrote it down this way. Rejoicing in hope, we could say, is we can rejoice in God's promises. So even though you may be going through difficulty, even though you may want to give up, even though you don't want to endure, when we look to the promises of God, that encourages us to keep going. What are some of the promises that you might think of? You might certainly might think of Romans 8, 28. For those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purposes. In other words, God's providentially going to make even the worst situation bear fruit of good things. We've been promised that God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. So even in the worst situation, God is still present. There are these promises that God gives us, and we can rejoice in them, even in the midst of difficulty. So how do we endure faithfully for others? Well, first, we can rejoice in the promises of God. Book of Titus, I wrote this down. Titus chapter 2, thank you. Verse 11 and 13, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what promise have we been given? What is our blessed hope? That Jesus is coming back. That the worst problems that we will ever have are by default temporary. Because we know Jesus is coming back one day. And he's going to set things right. We know that one day Jesus will return. And if we live to that day, we'll be excited. Because that is the great hope that we have. 
But even if we, uh, if we pass on before, we still have that same hope that we are going to be in God's presence and there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. And that's what we're looking to in that we rejoice in the promises of God. Paul gives us another saying, giving us evidence, or excuse me, giving us means by which we endure. And what was that? He tells us to rejoice in hope so that we can endure, and we do that by, yeah, look at verse 12. It says, be constant in prayer. I wrote it down this way. We should remember to pray. If you're going through hardship right now, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't imagine what we might be able to just talk about if we were all reflecting on some of the difficulties we might have right now. One of the ways in which we endure is just by remembering to pray. You know, we sure remember to pray when we're in a sense of emergency. And I've even heard people say, well, I guess there's nothing else we can do but pray. As if prayer should be our last resort, but prayer should always be our first response, not our last resort. But in prayer, we are coming to God and we're saying, God, if it would be your will, take this from me because I'm not having fun here. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And in that consistent and constant prayer, we're able to be able to find that strength to endure. Now, there is one final verse that, again, gives, in this case, two sayings that fit together to give us our last principle. And we'll find that in verse 13. Take a look. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And those two fit together. We contribute to the needs of the saints. That is, other believers were willing to help by... Showing hospitality, and hospitality, the original word just means love for strangers, but it's the idea, not that you really love strange people, but that you may not know someone, but you still want to show them love, and in the sense that you want to be hospitable to fellow believers in such a way that you meet their needs. The fourth principle I wrote down simply this way, we should give to each other freely. And that's how love is genuine. Sometimes people might need a little bit of your time. We should give our time freely to each other. Sometimes maybe people might need a, a bit of your talent. You might be able to do things that many other people can't. And maybe that you could share that at times. Yeah, even treasure that we give to people in need. But we should give generously. We should give freely. And, and that's what this last Two sayings fit together. Now let's review. The main thing that we want to be able to see is that we need to love honestly in holiness. We must honestly love others in holiness. Not an emotional love, but a commitment to the well-being of others. Seated in action, not emotion. What, what would that look like practically? we got four principles. We must love each other like family. Philostorge. We love, like, love our brothers like family. And we do that first. We should prioritize other people. Outdo one another in honor and showing honor. Be first to honor others. And we must not be lazy in our love. Not slothful in our zeal to serve each other. Secondly, we need to serve each other Fervently. Serve each other fervently. We do that because we are strengthened by the Spirit. Serving the Lord, we should be glorifying our God. The third way in which we show our genuine love is we can endure for each other faithfully. Yeah, suffer long. Not something you wanted to hear today, but nevertheless, it's in there. We can rejoice in God's promises. Not necessarily our present circumstances, but the promises of God give us great joy. But we should also remember to pray. Fourthly, we should give to each other freely. That's 
the picture of what it means to love each other honestly and genuinely in holiness. Our sincere love, our genuine love, our honest love without hypocrisy. That's the picture that God wants us to paint. Now that would be a question. Are you loving others sincerely? Do you have this genuine type of love where you're willing to give freely? You're willing to endure faithfully? You're willing to love like family? You're willing to serve fervently? Well, I want to close and I want to give you one good reason why. Uh, you could remember uh, John 13, 34, and 35. I've quoted a few times in the last couple times we've been talking about love. But Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. That our ability to show love, genuine love without hypocrisy, that shows other people that we are genuine followers of Christ. So I wrote it down this way and I close. Reaching our community rests on our compassion. Reaching our community rests on our compassion. 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to use this last verse or these last verses and then I'll close in prayer. But now concerning brotherly love, this 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 8 through 10. Now concerning brotherly love, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 10. Helps when I can see. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Again, the church of Thessalonica, Paul was pleased with this church. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs and work with your hands as we instructed you. Why? Why was he commanding them to love one another just as they were doing? And I could say this about our church. We've got some loving people in here. Uh, uh, the, the flowers at the altar are in memory of Leilani. We had her memorial service uh, yesterday. A lot of people just came to show love to what was a tragic death. But nonetheless, you show up well. You as a congregation show up and love each other. Just the opportunity that you have to show love to others is always met by you faithfully. And I thank God for you. Now why? Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to do it more and more? Look what he says in verse 12. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul is simply saying, as he agrees in other portions of Scripture, and 1 Peter 4, uh, you can look that up. Later, we'll talk about in our life groups, 8 to 11 gives another thing about a loving one another. Above all, love one another. But here's the idea. Oh, thanks, brother. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to another one another without grumbling. As each received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various grace. Thanks, Jason. The idea is this. Are you loving each other sincerely and genuinely? What would it look like if we all made a commitment to loving others like Jesus loved us? What kind of difference would it make not only in the lives of this church, but the lives of our community? If we could always be a group of people under the banner of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in order to glorify our Father in heaven, if we would just love each other. That's my challenge to you. Be better at love, because that's what we've been commanded to do. Let's pray. Father, like the church at Thessalonica, I, I thank you for this congregation, Lord. Just as we've seen with an outpouring of love when people go through great tragedy, as we see consistently, week in and week out, people using their own spiritual giftedness in order to enrich the lives of others, Lord, I thank you for a congregation that loves. But just as Paul told the Thessalonican believers that we should do this more and more, that we should be increasing in our love, we should such a way love each other that 
that others would be drawn by that love to you, that you alone would be glorified. But the means by which you've given us is simply in our love. Father, help us to love better, to love genuinely, sincerely, and honestly in such a way that you are glorified. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name and amen.